How are you guys doing? Good to see everyone this morning. Uh, today is an incredible day. Uh, it is Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, but I pray before we go into that, we can really be focused on God's Word. Amen. But we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, there are going to be two teams playing today, right? You got the Broncos and you got the Panthers. And who wants the Broncos to win? Nobody. Who wants the Panthers to win? Hey, hey, that's me too. Oh. Anybody but the Broncos. Amen. Well, uh, I got a, a cool lesson today. Come on, bro. And uh, it should be pretty awesome once I, I get there. But uh, it's going to be an intense game, right? There's going to be four 15-minute quarters. There's going to be some head-to-head combat. Um, There's going to be a lot of things going on in the game. Um, They're going to be throwing a pigskin football across the field, 100 yards or whatever it is. But it's going to be pretty competitive. And uh, in Mark chapter 10, in verse 35, I think these two brothers kind of had the same competitive spirit. And uh, as I was thinking about what to do today, um, I, I was thinking, you know, Super Bowl, how could I tie it into the, like, you know, the bowl? So we're going to be talking today a little bit about cups. Because I couldn't really think of a lesson to do with bowls. So I was like, I'm going to do a lesson on cups. it will be awesome. So, amen. Uh, in John 35, or in uh, Mark 10, verse 35. It's not John, it's Mark. In Mark 10, verse 35, the Bible reads, it says, Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I baptize with? We can, they said. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink. And be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those who, have it, ha, who it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became indignant with James and John. So they hear about this, they get a little upset because even the ten, they want to sit on the, the left and the right of Jesus, right? But uh, Jesus asked them a pretty important question. They're going, man, can we sit on the right or the left of you, Jesus? And Jesus goes, well, you, can you drink the cup? <laughs> That's a good question, right? Can, can you do your duty? Can you drink the cup? <laughs> and uh, it, it's kind of funny because they kind of agree to it before they even really understand fully what the cup is. And I, I think it's kind of similar like today, right? You have two teams playing each other. They've never really played each other before. And I'm sure the coaches and everyone else are going to be asking, how do you think you guys are going to do? Do you think you guys are going to win? Do you think you can get the job done? But I think Jesus would be telling them, can you drink the cup? <laughs> so that's the title of the lesson today. The first cup we're going to look at is the cup of family. And we're going to be talking about a little bit about Jesus' family. And uh, in honor of this point, I want us to come in a little bit more closer so we actually can be family and we can sit a little bit more close together. Now, I'm not talking to moms here that are nursing all that or on the sides, but I'm talking to everyone else. Let's, let's bring it all in, even the ushers too. Let's sit as family and honor God in a great way. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go to Mark 3 in verse 20. Let's bring it on in. Let's go. You guys are close enough, but let's fill up. Let's try and let's be within like four rows. Let's be from like Chris Directo on on or Brian and on or something like that. We're just too far back. We're operating a camera, great. But let's bring it in. Ronald, help me bring it in. <laughs> Amen. Who needs help? Who needs help? 
Amen. The couple family. We're going to look at the physical family of Jesus. Go Mark 3, in verse 20. The Bible reads, it says, Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He's out of his mind. And the teacher of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He's possessed by Beelzebub, by the prince of demons. He is driving out demons. Right here is pretty interesting. As the people, they gather around to see Jesus. He kind of, you know, when you go and visit Jesus, he kind of crowds the place. (laughs) And he's doing all these types of miracles, right? He's driving out demons. I'm sure he's healing people. And all these people come in and they want to really see what he's doing. And his family, even including Mary, goes, this guy's out of his mind. This guy's crazy. Have you guys ever studied the Bible with a family member before? Or even asked somebody about Jesus and they went, Man, what in the heck is this Jesus? What is this Christianity? In fact, you don't even know what you're talking about. And you appear a little weird or a little crazy yourself. And of course, you know, we give up and we go, well, this guy's not going to make it. You know, all that stuff. Um, But I I was kind of thinking about it and I was thinking, man, you know who would be the ultimate person to give up on? It would have been Mary. If you think about it. I mean, she was told through the Holy Spirit that she would have a baby. She's the only virgin Mary. (laughs) She raised Jesus. And she was well informed of who Jesus was. Yet she looks at Jesus and she goes, this guy is crazy. It's kind of cool even to know, you don't have to turn there, but in Acts 1 and verse 14, Mary along with Jesus' family is in the upper room praying. Um, and is among Jesus' closest disciples. Um, But that all happened because Jesus never gave up on Mary or his entire family. Have you guys ever seen the movie Taken? You know, Taken is pretty cranky. You got Liam, right? And the last person you want to meet in the alley, the dark alley, or whatever it is, probably would be Liam Neeson, right? Yeah. That or Terminator, I don't know, would be more scary, but, you know, he, he looks pretty scary, or whatever, but, but nothing's going to phase this guy from getting back his daughter, right? His daughter gets kidnapped in Paris, I think it was, and a um, bunch of guys took her, whatever, and, and this guy had the heart to do whatever it took to get her back, yeah. right? He's like, man, Go there, fly there. Hey, he destroys all these people, these cars and buildings and boats and all this stuff. But he'll do whatever it takes. I think we have to have the same mentality as disciples with our own family members. Yeah. We have to do whatever it takes to get them to become Christians. Yeah. You know, a lot of us have distant family. You know, as our church goes throughout the world... We're going to be planting many churches and we're going to be spreading geographically. But I'm wondering if we're reaching out to our distant families. So there's been so many uh, different communication methods. You got Skype, you got Facebook. Now you can even call on Facebook, on the Messenger. You guys ever notice that? You go to the Messenger and you can call people. Not only you can call people here locally and in the U.S. and all that, you even can make calls internationally. That's how I talk to Kyle all the time. But do we have the heart even for our distant family? What about our spiritual family? Go to Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 19, now this should be a pretty familiar passage. In Ephesians 2, in verse 19, the Bible reads, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. You know, the Bible says once you're in Jesus' church, you are a member of God's household. 
That means that if God is our Father, that means that we're all brothers and sisters, right? That means that we should have an intense love and care for each other and want to be with each other and help each other and serve each other. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Have you, have you guys ever thought, man, we're, I'm just too different. Oh. I'm just too different from this guy. Or, or this guy's different. Man, this guy's weird. This guy's crazy. <laughs> well, uh, I never really came upon this passage before. It's pretty interesting. In Isaiah chapter 11 in verse 1. Come on, bro. The Bible reads, it says, A shoe will come from the stump of Jesse, from his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Now, I had a little, I had a little pen in the, the other room, and I drew a little stump and a branch coming up. But basically, it's talking about old Israel. The stump is completely dead. Then you have a branch coming out of that stump. That branch is Jesus. And it says that he is going to bear fruit. Well, the fruit is the church. If you think about it, right? And we know that, of course, Jesus is from the line of Jesse. And he is indeed the branch because Jesse is David's father. And Jesus, of course, is in the line of David. Well, how is the church supposed to interact? Go go up a few verses. Go to verse 6. Now, this, this is the passage I never really caught before. It says, The wolf will, lie, will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling. That's a young lion. I learned that in the kids' room over there. <laughs> the yearling. Yeah. Somebody looked up on the internet. Well, it's a young lion. Amen. Together. And a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hand in the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand the banner for the peoples, the nations, will rally to him, and his place will rest, will be glorious. Now, it's kind of interesting because it's talking about the church. So how does, how does this all make sense? It says, this wolf is going to live with the lamb. Now, where do you... Now, how would that make sense? How would it make sense that the leopard would lie down with the goat? Of course, if it's talking about Jesus' church, right? A child is even reaching in a hole and he doesn't get bit by a snake. Well, I was kind of thinking about it, and he's making a a very big distinction. He's saying there is a very big difference in the kingdom and the world. See, the world wants to set up all types of different boundaries. But in the church, there are no boundaries. See, there's all kind of different races, right? Yeah. You have black people and white people and Latin people and Asian people, Latin people, Filipino people, Hawaiian people. You have all kind of different types of people, right? Yeah. Well, in the church, we all get along, right? Yeah. We're all fired up to be with each other, right? Yeah. But in the world, it's not like that. Yeah. See, where, where some races aren't accepted, right? Some people just don't get along. <laughs> You know, uh, in the church, different ages are acceptable, right? Yeah. Where you'll see a young guy fired up to be with, you know, talking to an old guy, right? On, you got people as young as, you know, the Savannahs and, you know, the uh, Rosas. And, you know, we got some, some young disciples among us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then you got the old people, right? Oh. Right, Rob? Oh, Chris. Right, Chris? Oh. You got some old guys. Oh, mature. 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 <laughs> well, well it, when, when Chris was young, the Dead Sea was still sick. I mean, I mean. <laughs> so, you know, some of us got a little age on us.
Christ, right? Oh, come on. Yeah. But the glory of the church is that we are different, and yet we are completely unified in our convictions about God. Amen. We're going to look at the second cup. Now, this cup is a bitter cup. It's the cup of death. Go to Romans chapter 6. And we're going to talk about a little bit about dying to ourselves spiritually. Sorry, I had to crack on Chris. No, ever since I heard that Robbie was an expert, uh, expert mark, marksman, I, I kind of stay away from Robbie. <laughs> no, who's the old guy? Okay. But then he's an expert shot, so... Hey, man, I'll stay away from that one. The cup of death. Die spirit. Go to Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Well, the Bible reads, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sin so that grace may increase? By no means. We die to sin. How can we live it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We are therefore buried with him through baptism into his death, in order just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Now, of course, they even get baptized, right? We know from Scripture we have to have faith. We have to have repentance. And repentance goes along with repentance. It's a decision to be a disciple. And then the Bible says we can get baptized. And we know that our sins are forgiven from Scripture whenever we come into contact with the blood of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And isn't it interesting that whenever Jesus died on the cross, that's where he shed his blood. And whenever we die, we're buried and resurrect, we get baptized. That's where we come into contact with Jesus' blood. But it does, doesn't just happen at baptism. Go to Luke chapter 9. Come on, bro. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, this also is a common passage. But the Bible talks about how we need to die to ourselves every day. It says in verse 23, it says... Then he said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. The Bible says that there is no vacations. That if we want to be a disciple, we have to think about it. We have to count the cost to see whether or not we want to die to ourselves everything, every single day. You know, it's kind of uh, interesting. It's not a bad thing in any way, but a lot of people wear the, the cross, mm -hmm. yeah. the jewelry. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you really think about what that represents, especially back then, the cross meant a wicked death. Mm -hmm. It's not the fairy tale Jesus a lot of us think when we think of the cross and the glory. It was a pretty, pretty unbelievable bad death. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Jesus goes, I don't want you to carry the imaginary Jesus cross. I want you to carry my cross. That's your cross. Go to John chapter 12. In verse 23. John chapter 12 in verse 23. So we die at baptism. We die to ourselves. And now we die to other people. Spiritually, of course, amen. Amen. In John 12, in verse 23. It says, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The charge and the admonition is, we got to be like this kernel. That if we don't die spiritually, we don't die to ourselves, we are not going to produce many seeds. You know, uh, I read on uh, Facebook a quote that was pretty funny. 
And it says, if you're not hungry for God, you're probably full of yourself. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, huh? If you're, not, if you're not hungry for God, you're probably full of yourself. And I was thinking about here in Hilo. I was thinking about all of us. And I was thinking about, man, we're on a mission team. You know, they can send over ministers and all this stuff, but they ain't ever going to send us a mission team. We are the mission team. <laughs> and I was thinking about our charge to evangelize all of the Hawaiian islands, of course. And I was thinking that the main two aspects of a mission team. Let's just break down the word. The mission and the team. <laughs> Genius thought, right? For every mission team, the success of it comes down to the mission of the team. But, where do mission teams fail? See, they either lose focus on the mission, or they just lose, lose track of the team. Have you guys ever walked into another room and just kind of like forgot where you guys were at? Or, or forgot what you were looking for? Yeah. Or been daydreaming and it was like, what the heck was I thinking about? I hear Mahi sing, yeah, but I'm, yeah. it's kind of quiet over here. <laughs> See, I do it all the time. But whenever we're not focused on the mission, we're not focused on the team, it's not going to happen. We lose sight of our goal. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3. The Bible reads in verse 3, it says, This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. That man is Christ Jesus. No, it's pretty cool that God's will is that He wants everyone to be saved. There's not one person that God does not want to be saved, right? Right. But you guys got to ask yourself, is God's will my will? Is God's will your will? You know, uh, I've been so proud, not in any kind of condescending way or anything like that, but I've been so fired up and, and encouraged by just the hearts of the disciples. I'm not really a results guy. I don't care if we have a thousand people come through here or one person. I'm not really about that. But I've been inspired by the hearts of the disciples in the church just wanting to go reach out and share their faith. And you got the Puna group going to the mall. I didn't even know they were doing that. Uh, but it turns out they're going to the mall and, and, and they're saying, I ain't, we ain't giving up until we get someone. Uh, you got the Directo. Directo, Chris is taking Rich around and sharing and all that stuff. I mean, you, you got Shane. Shane's like the, Shane's like the master follow-up guy. He's, <laughs> I, I, Shane, who, who we got here? He'll, he'll text message me like five guys. Like, okay, we got this, this, this. He just has a heart to follow up with people. And I've been so inspired. Me and Mel were talking about uh, the other day. Like, man, we're just encouraged by the church. Just, I don't know, just the campus. The Bible it's like, you know, we're getting the, we're getting the heart. We're getting the, the vision. We're, we're, we're wanting to do God's will. It's awesome. The cup of friendship. Go to... Uh, Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Now we're going to talk a little bit about being God's friend. In Hebrews chapter 5. In Hebrews 5, in verse... Well, I thought that was an encouraging scripture. <laughs> Well, I mean, he's kind of, kind of making my point at me a little bit. In verse uh, 7, in Hebrews 5 and verse 7, the Bible just says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. The, it's talking about Jesus' relationship with God. And how he interacted with his father was, it was an emotional relationship. Kind of like, well, Daniel right there. <laughs> I got a little emotional there. And uh, do you know how 
You know, whenever we bond with people, you, know, you get really, really close to one another. You bond, and it's, you know, sometimes we get extremely close to one another whenever we're going through a hard time. But that's the same bond that we need to have with, with God, a bond where we can be real with God, a bond where we can be honest and open of where we're at. And I was kind of wondering, for the church, I was going, where are we at today? Every individual is different. So where are you at? Well, I think this, this scripture is a good test. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Because this guy is not breaking out the lukewarm scripture. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> this is a good test to see where you're at. Go to Revelation chapter 3. In verse 14, the cup of friendship. The Bible reads in verse 14, it says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I'm rich, I've acquired wealth. And then the thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so that you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so that you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve upon your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Here's a good limit test to see where, where you're at. See, it, it describes three scenarios. Either you're hot, either you're lukewarm, or you're cold. Come on, bro. And have you guys ever had lukewarm tea? Yeah. 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 It's not very good, right? You just want to spit it out. <laughs> Even that with coffee. Right? Coffee's not too good, lukewarm either. It's either got to be, those, those drinks either got to be really cold or really hot. But that lukewarm drink, it's just no good. Now, on the other hand, a lukewarm shower, that's awesome, right? Even the day, you know, I was in the shower. And, you, know, you know how you get in there and it's not too hot, not too cold, it, it, it feels nice. Some people take a bath and all this stuff, I understand that, but for me it's a shower. But whenever I get like that, you know how you zone out? You kind of go into la la land, and that's really the danger of being lukewarm. You kind of zone out. So what's hot? Well, hot is, you know, sharing your faith. You're inviting people to, you know, church and midweek and all this stuff. You're fired up to come to church in midweek. Uh, you're fired up to read your Bible and pray. You're just excited about your relationship with God. You just can't wait because you know your God's your friend. Well, what's cold? Well, cold is the exact opposite. Yeah. I don't read my Bible. I don't want to pray and go to midweek. It's tough. And even Sundays, man, this is, this is a drag. I'm like a robot here. I mean, this isn't good. Well, what's, well, what's lukewarm? Lukewarm is everything in the middle. And Jesus goes, man, if you want to be my friend, you have to be hot for me. Amen. You know, I think even some of us uh, in here, we have to see where we're at. I think in a group this size, I mean, obviously people are lukewarm. Some people are lukewarm. Some people are hot. Some people are fired up. Maybe even some people are cold. But I think some of us have even gotten lukewarm. And I never really caught in verse 20 before. It's pretty interesting. It says, I'll read it again. It says, or I'm sorry, 19. It says, Those whom I love are rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. I never really realized that, you know, if we're lukewarm, then God's on the outside of the door. And the other thing I didn't really realize is why is he at the door? Well, 
Because a lot of us have locked them out. And I was thinking about it even more, is I think a lot of us can go from treating God like a friend to locking them out and treating God like a stranger. No, you got to ask yourself, and has he been a stranger in my life? Do I keep on inviting him in and kicking him out, inviting him in and kicking him out? Or where am I at with that? Well, I think if we're doing that, I would encourage the church, man, we got to make him a friend again. Yeah. I mean, he's got to be your best friend. He's not that relationship where you just don't like and you just treat him mediocre or whatever. God has got to be your best friend. You know, uh, as uh, you know, we talked about the lesson, the cup, and all that. I was thinking about it. everyone has their favorite cup, right? Yeah. yeah. Most of us have our favorite cup, right? <laughs> yeah. Got to change that up a little bit. Yeah. 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 You know, we, we we all you know. Robbie, I was in the the, the kids' class doing the the lesson for the children's workers. And uh, Robbie said that his favorite cup was the, the USS Navy cup. What's, yeah, Midway. The Midway cup. Oh, the Midway cup. <laughs> Everyone's got their favorite. For me, it's the Steelers cup. Oh, I got this, this long. I mean, I'm sure Chris got the Raiders cup. <laughs> but the Steelers cup, I, I'm sure today, you know, I, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to relax. I'm going to watch the, the Super Bowl. And I'm going to sit down. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chug that, that cranking cup, you know, full of Coke. <laughs> Sprite or whatever it is, and I'm going to watch the game. <laughs> but today I got to ask you this question: Is can you drink Jesus' cup? Can you drink the cup that Jesus drank? I love you guys, and God bless. <laughs>